George Sowers is going to tell us about the Lunar Polar Prospecting Workshop in 2018, uh, which took a first stab at uh, the topic that we're trying to get a campaign defined for. So George, over to you. I'll be driving the slides. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All righty. So in 2018, we conducted the Lunar Polar Prospecting Workshop at the Colorado School of Mines. Next chart. Our target was the water ice and the PSRs near the poles of the moon. And as we all know by now, the economic importance of water in space is enormous. In particular, if you consider it uh, processed into liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen propellants. I'm fond of saying water is the oil of space. Next chart. So when we talk about developing and utilizing a resource, whether on Earth or on the moon, we're talking about an economic activity. It's not science, though science will be used and science can benefit, and it's not exploration, though the benefits to exploration are potentially huge. So there are proven processes for developing a resource. Essentially, we have to be able to characterize the lunar water ice as a proven reserve. And to do that, we have to gain knowledge in two dimensions represented by the two axes on this figure. The vertical dimension is increasing geologic knowledge. We have to be able to quantify the amount of the resource in the deposit by direct measurement. The horizontal dimension are all the other factors to develop the resource, the mining technologies, processing technologies, the markets, the economics, uh, the legal aspects, all that other stuff. Uh, the aim of the resource exploration campaign is to develop that geologic knowledge on that vertical dimension. Next chart. So the objective of our workshop in 2018 was to develop a roadmap for lunar polar prospect or lunar polar resource exploration campaign that can lead to industrial scale production of water and propellant within a decade. Um, it was co-sponsored by the League and the Space Resources Roundtable. It was actually conducted right after the uh, SRR in 2018. We had over 100 attendees, and this was back in the days when we were all in person. Uh, we had folks from NASA, USGS, industry, academia, um, and I'm assuming that uh, a bunch of people on the call today were part of that workshop. And there's a report online at that, uh, at that URL right there, next chart. So we started with the idea of strategic knowledge gaps. Um, what are, what's the information we need to be able to characterize water ice as a proven reserve? <clears throat> and there are essentially three types of data. First, we need to find, you know, or pinpoint the location of at least one economically vi viable ice deposit. And we took a stab at characterizing what we mean by economically viable uh, what we sh showed in the workshop, we need a deposit of at least 25,000 metric tons of ice, uh, at least 4% by mass um, within the first meter and all within one square kilometer. Uh, we also need to understand the physical characteristics of the icy regolith, you know, the densities of both the regolith and the ice, things like porosity, thermal and electrical properties, mechanical properties, understand how those properties vary with depth. And then also important, uh, as we saw in uh, LCROSS, is the presence and characterization of other volatiles. Because as we're processing water, those things end up being contaminants. Uh, and then we also need to be able to characterize the, the deposit sites themselves, the slopes, the roughness, uh, things of that nature. Next chart. Next. All right, we came up with six findings. I won't go through all of them, but I believe they're all still uh, quite relevant. Uh, finding number three, I think, is important. Um, we have a good foundation of remote sensing data. But what we need first and foremost going forward is ground truth. That is direct confirmation of surface and subsurface conditions that correspond to a particular remote sensing signature. Uh, in addition, we should view resource exploration as a targeted campaign, as been, has been mentioned already, uh, to fill these knowledge gaps, not a series of singular isolated missions. Again, we're doing resource development, not science, and not exploration. 
And finally, every effort should be made to minimize the cost of this campaign. Uh, after all, economics is key. Next chart. So we also came up with six recommendations. I list them here, but in the interest of time, I'm going to go to I'm going to skip to the next chart, which is the roadmap that embodies each of these recommendations. So this was the primary output of the workshop. It shows a path to industrial scale production of propellants within 10 years from start. Uh, the years are all off because we actually didn't start in 2018, unfortunately. Uh, the top row shows the development and deployment of the of the mining and processing systems, uh, the technology development, uh, production, and then deployment of those systems. Uh, the second row shows uh, the complementary activity of uh, developing geologic models and resource maps. <clears throat> and then the resource exploration campaign takes place in four phases. Uh, as I just mentioned, first and foremost, is one or more ground truth missions. These are landers into targeted locations that can be used to correlate our remote sensing data with what's actually present on the ground. Um, and a plug for my uh, posters coming up, uh, a concept for that one of those, that kind of mission uh, will be presented. Uh, second is a series of CubeSat and low cost impactor swarms. Uh, the basic idea of this is to dramatically increase the resolution of the remote sensing data. You know, the data we have today is good, but it's not of the resolution that we need to characterize the resources. Uh, third uh, is based on the first two phases to send a few landers to some of the most promising locations. And then finally, and only after we have a high confidence site in mind, do we send in a rover to do detailed surveys and measurements, actual gridded type measurements of the resource? And with that, I'll go to my last chart. Next, which is a quote by John Marburger, who was uh, President uh, Bush the Younger's science advisor. The moon has unique significance for all space applications for a reason that to my amazement, is hardly ever discussed in the popular accounts of space policy. The moon is the closest source of material that lies far up Earth's gravity well. Anything that can be made from lunar material that costs comparable to Earth manufacture has an enormous overall cost advantage compared to objects lifted from Earth's surface. The greatest value in the moon lies neither in science nor in exploration, but in its material. And with that, I'm done. All right, thanks. Uh... Thanks very much, George.